Hi, everyone. This is Hal Luftig with my Broadway Podcast Network show, Broadway Biz, where every episode I will chat with my friends, some of the top theater professionals in the business, about the business of Broadway. Our guest today is one of my favorite director choreographers, Jerry Mitchell. Jerry is a two-time Tony Award winner for Best Choreography. I can't believe it's been over 20 years since I first saw him on stage. I'm so excited to welcome Jerry to Broadway Biz. Hi. Hi, everybody. Who are we talking to? Well, let's hope a lot of people. (laughs) Um, I, I just felt I needed to start off with a, with a, as I usually do in these things with, you know, how I'm connected to our guest. So in the case of Jerry, it's a very, I think, interesting story back in 1991, dude, God, 1991, there was a musical called the Will Rogers Follies. And it was all about, it was a stage version of Will Rogers reading the newspaper, being, you know, optimistic, telling jokes and stories that were supposed to lift us all up. And it was in its own way, a a Follies kind of-esque show, which meant it had beautiful girls dancing around him and uh, kind of some vaudeville acts interspersed in the show. When the curtain came up at the Palace Theater, there were the stage was in complete darkness, but you heard this constant beating of a drum, like boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and as the lights slowly came up in in first in silhouette and then more and more, so you could figure out what who that person was. And he <laughs> was just starting, you know, to dance to the boom, 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 boom. And I remember this to my friend who uh, who now lives in Denver, who was with me. He he practically was speechless, and he like grabbed my arm and he said, "Who is that guy?" <laughs> I I wanted to share with our listeners that you created, you, Jerry Mitchell, uh, what we now know as Broadway Bears, as part of the Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS um, organization. Can you tell us how that came about? Because it's a major fundraiser. It was 1990, 1991, and Broadway Cares and Equity Fights AIDS were two separate organizations. And the kids in the original Lacage at the Palace Theater started a fundraising event for AIDS uh, relief and AIDS charity at the time. It was an Easter bonnet competition. And that was really the only... Um, that was the only annual event that was starting to grow and raise money for uh, Broadway Cares or Equity Fights AIDS. Jason Opsall, John Ganun, and, Tro- and Troy Britton Johnson, who were my dressing roommates on the Will Rogers Follies, and Jack Doyle, one of them, and I think it was Jason, said, why don't you go dance on the bar at Splash in that costume and let people tip you and, and we'll raise money. Go, go dancing. And I went, Ding, 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 ding. A light went out on over my head. I called up six other guys. I got them together. I choreographed a little opening number. We went to Splash one Sunday night after the matinee, and we charged $10 to get in. And we all got up and did the opening number. Then we all did a solo strip. And then we go-go danced, and they put money in our money in our G-strings. Well, the show was a big success, and it, and it was over with. And Brian and Harry, the owners of the club, came to the dressing room. They said, Hey guys, if we kick everybody out of the bar, we can start fresh and we can do a second show. We'll charge them $10 to get back in. You guys do a second show and we'll make twice the amount of money. And I looked at the boys and the guy said, let's do it. Everybody made out and it was fabulous. Made out in the sense that we made out like bandits with cash. And I had a pillowcase full of wet dollar bills and I had no idea how much money was in there. And I took it the next morning to Broadway Cares and they counted it and told, called me up later that day and said, you raised 
thousand dollars. And I went, Oh my God. And then literally within 24 hours, I said, I'm going to do one in six months and I'm going to add girls and I'm going to make it bigger and better. And we continued to do this show, which continued to literally grow like a fire to last year, the 29th version over 200 dancers, Hammerstein ballroom. And we raised just over $2 million in one night of burlesque. That is incredible. If anybody ever asked me, would a burlesque show with eight guys turn into a 29-year annual event that has raised collectively over $20 million for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, not to mention produced productions of it in Vegas, San Francisco, London, West End Bears, and last year for the first time, Italy Bears, I would have said, you are crazy, crazier than a loon. I never would have thought that would have happened to this show. This show became, this a fundraiser has literally become one of the four yearly events that is part of Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS now. Wow. Well, it's uh, and and Jerry has the distinction of having Rizzoli uh, put out a Broadway Bears book, correct? Yes, we put out we put out a book to, for the twentieth anniversary, and uh, it's sort of if you look if you get that book, it um, tracks each year and how much money was made each year. One of the great things shows all the posters from twenty years. It's going to be time to do another one next year for the thirtieth anniversary. Wow! Wow! Time just like. Whew. Look, I, I came to New York City in 1980. I was 20 years old, and the AIDS crisis was just starting to hit us and hit us hard. And by the time 1990, when I started Broadway Bears, I had lost 10, no, I had lost eight of my closest friends from college. I needed to do something to give back, and I used my creative sense as a director choreographer and my love of community to figure out a way to give back to my community. And, and it also, in, in, in turn, it was the most selfless act I think I've ever done in my life to, to get up on stage and strip because it takes a lot of cojones to take your clothes off in front of people. It really does. Teaches you a lot about, about the power you have as a person and how you can control any situation because a stripper is in charge of the room. Trust me. You can tell all those eyes are looking at you and you can tell them when to look and when not to. You are in charge. And as an actor, it was a great lesson for me because it was a, it was a fear that I had to overcome. The idea of creating something to give back to the community selflessly in turn allowed the community to see my work as a director and choreographer like yourself, Hal, and other producers, they saw what I was doing. And suddenly I was getting asked to meet on a possible show. And so now on Broadway Bears, I invite young up and coming choreographers to participate and choreograph numbers. The AIDS crisis stopped stopped dance a little bit in musicals. There were no musicals that had a lot of dance because all of the choreographers who were working were passing away. And as you know, as a producer, it costs it's so much money to, to invest in a new musical, no matter what the year is, that suddenly you're putting all of this money on the line with a young choreographer who has no track record. And it was a very difficult time in the 80s to get a new musical and new people produced. Wow. You know, Jerry, thank you for that. And thank you for what a wonderful bridge uh, into what I was really hoping we can talk about. You know, the purpose of this program is to talk to the different artists, the different department of artists that come together to make a Broadway show. And what I'm most interested in, and I hope our listeners are, is, is how that financial side of the business, you know, the show business, right. it matches it's artistic side. So, you know, I'm going to ask you a couple of, you know, I want to ask about process and things like that for you. So in beginning a new musical, what is your process of discovering a story? I'm, I'm, I'm actively seeking out things that I want to tell, like Becoming Nancy. I found that book. I read that book. And then I called you guys and said, would you help me produce this? Because I want to tell this story. I, I really look for shows when I'm looking at a show, I'm looking for a universal theme. I am mm -hmm. looking for a message of hope. I really think that's important. And most importantly, I'm looking for something in the story that I actually feel like I, 
I can place myself in that story. How do you know that a story is a good musical? Even Legally Blonde wasn't a musical on the film. No, but th- if you watched the movie, there were two things that I thought. First of all, she was an incredibly strong heroine. Elle Woods, just like David Starr, is an incredibly strong hero in in mm-hmm. um, in uh, Becoming Nancy. And just like Lola and Charlie, both are heroes in, in Kinky Boots. They have something that they have to overcome. They, they're, they're either misunderstood or they're being, being given the short end of the stick. They have something to prove. And they're a little bit larger than life. Uh, characters that are a little bit larger than life, I find it's very easy to hear them sing. It's very easy to see them dance because those expressions are when talking isn't enough and you have to get even bigger with your bigger with your emotion. Uh, so I'm looking usually for characters that really have some place to travel to from the first moment you meet them to the last moment of the story. First thing I think is I want a hundred million dollars, and then I wake up and I go, okay, I'll be lucky if I can get ten. <laughs> so how am I going to tell this story with with a budget? And then I and then on the a week later I ask myself, what do I really need to tell this story? If we use Legally Blonde as an example, you, Kristen, Mike, and Dory were incredible with me because you gave me such free reign as a um, director to choose my creative team, David Rockwell, Greg Barnes, Kenny Posner, and to work with who I had worked with all of them as a choreographer on previous musicals. You were very, you never told me what I could and couldn't do. You let me go crazy. And then you told me, we have to rein it in because of this, because of this, because of this. And we did, and we brought it down and we presented a beautiful show on Broadway. But when it got time to do the tour, we knew that we wouldn't be able to sustain that kind of a financial show on the road. And I was given a real challenge. Really, it was Mike who came to me. I'm sure you guys had many discussions, but Mike's uh, work on the road is so vast. And, and he came to me and he said, this is what we think the show is going to make each week on the road. And in order for the show to be successful, we can only spend this much money on the set. And we can only skip in, we have to come in as a guarantee for this much money. Well, I didn't know any of those things when I was a first time director of a first time uh, national tour. So the process for me as a director was a challenge. Can you tell your story for $6 million as opposed to $60 million? And I said, yes, and I did. And we were a huge success. So I always think big first is the is the answer to your question, and then I and then I think like a producer because in in a sense I am a producer. I produce Broadway Bears. You know I know what to, I know how to put on an extravagant show with a G string and five dollars. So why can't I apply that to a Broadway musical? Let's talk about casting for a second because um, in my experience you are one of the best director, choreographer, casters I've ever seen. Um, You know, you have plucked people from total obscurity and they've gone on to be major stars. Well, you look for, you look for the person who comes in and is the perfect fit for the material, right? And, And when that happens, magic happens on stage because you, you've suddenly put somebody in the role who should be playing, should, is the role. Right. So your work as a director and choreographer, I think it was Mike Nichols said that 90 percent of director's job is in casting. If you cast it right, you're going to be successful because you'll have the right person telling the story. And, you know, I thank you for that compliment that I find people who are unknown and turn them into stars. We do. But the truth of the matter is every director does that. That's that's the job of every director. Because most of the people you're going to hire in musicals and in theater, not all, but a a good deal of them, are going to be people no one's ever heard of before, just like they've never heard of the character in the story. And then suddenly, they meet the character and the actor meet, and bang, that's what a star is. It's an explosion of talent, writing talent, and, and acting talent coming together and going, wow. And all I am is the person who saw that person fit that material and then i just kind of guide them to deliver it in the best possible way 
but when they walk into the room for the audition, they will they will win it on their first impression. Uh, Annalee Ashford walked into the room and with pink bows on her shoes, and I had listened to. 30 or 40 girls come in and read Margo and sing and try to talk to a chihuahua. And when, when Annalie Ashford did the scene and tried to make me believe that she was talking to a dog and the dog was talking back, I was laughing so hard, I could not control myself. And she walked out of the room and I said, well, that, that's it. She's the girl. Yeah. Sometimes you have made a decision for a role without without auditioning them. And I'll give you an example. When uh, you were over in London uh, and we were casting the London Blonde, uh, you had seen this actress, uh, turned out to be Sheridan Smith, and you called me and said, Hal, we found our UK um, uh, L Woods. And I said, really? Who? I had never heard of her. And I remember very just, you know, clearly saying, Jerry, that's nice, but I think now we know we're going to need, you know, well, let's look and see if we can get someone, you know, that, that you know, will sell tickets. And Sheridan, A, uh, a won the Olivier Award, her first for Best Actress. And I was nominated for an Olivier for Hairspray in London. And she got on stage and sang suddenly Seymour from the West End production of um, Little Shop, I saw her in the bar afterwards and we both had a Cosmo in our hand. I said, a pink Cosmo. I said, you're born to play Elle Woods. And we just hit it off and started talking. And I thought, oh, I just spent a little bit of time with her there. And I thought, oh, she could play this part and knock it out of the park. Well, what's interesting and why I asked that question was uh, when you told me that, as you said, she was in uh, Little Shop of Horrors, a small production of Little Shop of Horrors on the West End. And I went to see it. And she was a delightful Audrey. But in my mind, I couldn't make the connection because Elle is so different. What was you know amazing was you said that she's R.L. Woods at least 12 months before she, you know, officially became R.L. Woods. And, you know, I, I just, what made... Her Audrey. For me, what I saw in her as an actress was the was the vulnerability she was able to deliver. L, you meet Elle Woods, and she's gorgeous, and she's blonde, and she's rich. What's the problem? Oh, she got her heart broken by her boyfriend. What's the problem? We've all gotten our hearts broken. What you what you realize is that she actually is a person who believes in in the good in everyone. And she's a person who will stand by her friends, Paulette, when they lose their dog and fight to get their dog back. I mean, you find these things out about this girl and and she gets you to root for her. But the girl has to be unsure of her confidence in order to end up becoming the confident person who wins in the end. And she was able to play that vulnerability card so beautifully. Laura Bell did the same thing. Anybody who's been cast in that role for me, I've been doing a lot of online things with classes and schools and uh, colleges, as we all are, and they are all doing Legally Blonde. And they ask me, what's the most important thing you could tell me? And I say, find the truth in these people. These are real people. Just like yeah. uh, uh, Kinky Boots, yes. those factory workers are based Pretty much. On, and let's talk about that for a second, because um, I, I think that's incredibly interesting and our listeners would like to hear that. You saw the film, you know, yes. Daryl called me and then we called you and we took you to lunch and we talked to you about the film, which you had seen. Correct me. Did you see yes. it? Uh, no, yeah. I, I didn't um, see it until you guys sent it to me. Mm -hmm. Once once you mm -hmm. sent it to me, I watched it. and Yeah. Yeah. And you agreed that it would, you know, be a good musical. Then you went over to just get a little piece of research. I know you went over to uh, London, to UK, Northampton, and yes. actually was given a tour of a factory that had these women that were currently that worked there. And I went, I went to London and I, I went to the factory where they shot the film Kinky mm -hmm. Boots. It's the Trickers factory in Northampton. Mm -hmm. One of the few small factories that's mm -hmm. still in operation. 
And yeah, all those factory workers were in that shop. Yeah. <laughs> I took a ton of pictures and I took a ton of videos on the tour of not just the, 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 the actual factory, but the people who were working in the factory and the machines they were working on and how they were making the shoes. And I downloaded all of that information into a Dropbox for the original Broadway cast. Mm. And the cast absorbed those videos and started to draw and build their characters out of watching these real people in the real factory. And it was so important to the, to the truth of our musical that there was this real truthful world with a real truthful job every day making shoes and a fantastical world, which also had its own truth of a drag performer surrounded by backup. And it was all made with feather glitter and a hot glue gun, feathers glitter and a hot glue gun. So you had these, these two worlds competing to tell this, how are these two mindsets going to come together and succeed? And it was such a simple idea, but such a great one. So you saw the movie. Um, we approached Harvey Firestein because we thought, you know, wow, that would, he would be a great person. And and no secret, he originally turned it down. Yeah. And um, we had a different set of music uh, composers, and no secret, they, you know, ended up not working out. How did you, what was the process for you of getting a, you know, getting a Harvey to a yes? And then clearly he suggested Cindy, um, yeah. Lopper, and you had to, you know, basically walk her through the construction of a song and what you needed that song to tell. What was, well, what was that like? Let's go, let's go back to getting, getting an author to say yes. <laughs> um, I went to Harvey. Maybe I. Maybe you know this. Maybe you don't. I went to Harvey on Legally Blonde. I did not <gasps> see. So I was coming off of two big, really amazing events for me in my life. One was Hairspray, working with Harvey, which was completely mm-hmm. joyous, mm-hmm. and the other was La Caja Full, which won Best Revival and I won Best Tony for choreography. And again, working with Harvey and Harvey up in. Till up through that point was so um, generous to me and so supportive of everything I did. So when it came time for Legally Blonde, the first person I thought I wanted to write the book was Harvey Firestein. So I went to Harvey and I asked him and he said, oh, darling, no, no, darling, not for me, not for me. Darling. So that was really hard for me because I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to get Harvey to write this book. Blah, blah, blah. That didn't happen. So then Kinky Boots happened and I went to him and I don't remember him saying no to me. So I mean, he might have said no to you guys. He might have said no. To, he, did say, he said no to Daryl. I mean, but he, he said yes to me when I asked from the very first time. And I said, okay, this is great. And then we, we, we um, started to play and it didn't work out, like you said. And then Harvey said, what about sin? And I said, well, that's a great idea. And I think it was his brother who mentioned it to him and he called her up. And, you know, Sin and I had worked together a couple of times on the gay games. I choreographed her and I choreographed a video for her and she had been in Broadway Bears for me. So we knew each other also and through Alan Cumming. And it was, it was sort of like one of those things where I'm working with two people who I feel are family in a lot of ways. I don't feel like there had to be any filter between us when we talked about things. So the collaboration was very comfortable from the very beginning. And Cindy, the reason the show was a success and the reason Cindy won a Tony Award for her score, the reason Cindy won all of the accolades and the reason the score is so good is because Cindy never pretended like she knew more than anyone else in the room. She was listening to Harvey's incredible guidance as an, as a book writer on what's needed to get to the next beat for the characters. And, you know, and when I, we were at the end of the first act and I knew I wanted to do this big production number. I wanted everybody dancing and I wanted to celebrate with the factory workers and the angels. And I wanted the, the conveyor belts working as treadmills. And she said, what do you want the song to be? And I said, I want it to be, yeah, we made the boots. Yeah, we did this. Yeah, we did that. She said, okay. And she came back the next day and the song was called Everybody Say Yeah. And she wrote the song. You know, I mean, she took the information and then she came back and delivered in spades. And, and when, and, you know, when we couldn't find the right number for Lola, she wrote 
uh, you know, Angel Gone to the Devil. Nope. She wrote Black Widow. Nope. She wrote Land of Lola. Yes. Ding, 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 ding. Yes, we'll take it. And suddenly you had another hit number in the show. So she really never stopped, never stopped doing the work. I remember having the conversation with you um, that, you know, that Jerry, this has to be, you know, a reasonable musical and we're going out of town and this is, and you, um, you said, you know, I, I understand that. Let me go and think about it. And then you, you suggested a, you know, incredible uh, design team. Um, David Rockwell for the sets and Kenny Posner for the lights and Greg Barnes for the costumes, um, all of who was nom- who were nominated. Um, how did you, you know, process that? But I had said, you know, Jerry, we have to make it economical. Um, and how did you process it? And how? What was the process of talking to your designers in in that way? Because. One of the great things was when we finally did see all the design elements, it was it was incredibly economical. And I thought that was stunning because usually you get a bid for sets, lights and costumes that's like in the stratosphere. The, the, the trick with the show was as I read the script and worked on the script and digested and dissected the script, 90% of the time we were in the shoe factory or near the shoe factory, outside the shoe factory, in the shoe factory, around the shoe factory. And I thought to myself about all of the places I've gone in my life, the little gay clubs where I've seen the Lolas of the world perform. And I thought to myself, how do I mix the two worlds? And that was the beginning of the idea that I presented to David about what if we told the entire story in the factory? I said, we're not going to be making real shoes on stage, but I have to give these factory workers something to do that makes the audience believe they're working. And when I went to the shop in in Northampton, you would see them pushing things and rolling things and everything. There were no conveyor belts for shoes. It was all on roller racks, pushing pieces, lifting boxes. You saw these guys working constantly like that if they're not tied to a machine. And I said, well, what if the set was moved by the factory workers? The factory workers were always doing the work. And David loved that idea. So we started to create the factory, the inner life of the factory. And I didn't know it at the time, Hal, but by keeping the running cost of the show low, by using that simple concept, we were protecting the property in a major way. Right. Yes. And I remember a, a wonderful producer who, you know, and I know very well, God bless her, Margot Lyon. I remember her once having a conversation with me and saying, if you know the, va- the street value of the story you're telling, you'll know how much money to invest in telling it. And it was something of that nature, she said yeah. to me. And yeah. I've always used that now whenever I approach a project what is the value, the street value of the story you're telling? So it kind of lets you know how much you can invest in telling that story and still protect yourself to have a successful run. So, yeah. and, and that's really, I said that we're going to spend all the money in Milan. That's where we're going to put the bang for our buck. When we get to Milan, the show is going to explode into an extravaganza no one's ever seen. Let's spend it there. And that's what we did. And I, I, and I remember um, even what we had in Chicago uh, was not as explosive as, as you then yeah. realized you wanted. And we, you know, upped the game for the Broadway, which is what Kenny did so brilliantly with the, you know, the neon lights changing and the different boots yeah. appearing. That, that, was, uh, that was a big game changer too. Yeah. But it was your vision that led that charge, you know, and you mentioned Margot. I just have to say, I'd be remiss if I didn't say how wonderful a producer she was. She was almost like a mentor towards me and um, I miss her, you know, really very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Terrible. Yeah. You know, and she was a wonderful producer and, and I just want to, as we wind down here, I have a question. I swear I'm not fishing for <laughs> compliments, but if you should throw some, I wouldn't say no. Um, you are a co-producer on with us on Becoming Nancy. Yes. Um, so in your opinion, what makes a good producer? 
telling the truth to whom <laughs> telling telling the truth to everyone involved your your team your director your choreographer your i think i think what makes what makes a great producer for me is a, is a sense of trust i need to trust my producers and that you know as you as you grow in this business and you become more um experienced you you realize that everyone's everyone should be in the theater for the same reason to make this show or this story the most amazing success it can be and if everyone is in that mindset i find that the collaboration is so much easier but uh understanding understanding the importance of the storytelling and then being able to support that a producer needs to support the support the team that's putting it together and allow them a long enough lead so they can make mistakes and figure out how to best tell it because sometimes out of those mistakes come the solutions right a perfect example was the damn sword box and kinky boots which we which we we must have spent more time and more money and more conversations on why isn't it working? Why isn't it working? Why isn't it working? Until finally one afternoon in New York, a week before we opened, I figured it out. Mm -hmm. I figured it out. But you didn't ever come up to me and hit me over the head and say, if you don't take that out tomorrow, I'm closing the show, right? That wouldn't have worked for me, right? So, so you allowed me to have my process. And I think I think it's probably one of the reasons we have had so many great collaborations and will continue hopefully to have them in the future is that we get each other on some level some unspoken level we get each other and the, and we trust each other we really do trust each other and I think that that has made for many successes for us and we've had some failures too let's not let's not kid ourselves you know, yes, but you know yes. we've all had them we've all had them everyone in this business has had failure and usually from failure comes a great solution to success for the next project yeah that that is true i that is true you know you yeah. try to learn something from each show that you do, whether it's yeah. a success or a failure, what sometimes you don't even sometimes you don't even know you've learned something until you get to the next project, right? Right, and you go, oh no, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, that's that is so true. Well, well said. Um, well, Jerry Mitchell, this has been so much fun, but like all good things, it must come to an end. But before I let you go, I'm going to ask you three rapid wrap up questions uh, okay. that that um, I just ask that when I ask them, you don't think about it. You just kind of like a, like a, you know, one of those tests, you just say what first thing that comes to your mind. And just so you know, I'm not picking on you. I do this with every guest. Okay. Um, so you ready? Here's the first yep, one. Ready. What is your favorite musical? A chorus line. What is the wackiest moment you experienced in the theater. The wackiest moment when Jerry Robbins took the scissors from Irene Sheriff and charged up on the stage and cut the baby crook's costume. And she just sat there. You could smoke in the theater at the time. She just sat there in the theater and continued smoking. It didn't even flinch. Their relationship was going back so far. She didn't care. He was destroying her costume with scissors and she just let him do it. I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the final one is riffing on that. So the lesson learned from that experience was? Always say what you want to say. Don't be afraid. Your idea might be better. Yep. Wow. Well, Jerry Mitchell, I love you. I can't thank you enough. This has been a pleasure and a joy, and I love you dearly. Thanks for joining us today. Love you, Hal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Broadway Biz. If you have any questions about today's episode or the business of Broadway in general, let me know on Instagram at Broadway Biz Podcast or via email at broadwaybiz at halluftig.com. Be sure to follow me at Broadway Biz Podcast for updates on everything Broadway Biz, the business of Broadway. 
Broadway Biz is part of the Broadway Podcast Network. Huge thanks to Dory Berenstein, Alan Seals, and Brittany Bigelow. This has been produced by Dylan Marie Parent and Kevin Connor and edited by Derek Gunther. Our fabulous theme music is by Nell Benjamin and Lawrence O'Keefe. To learn more about Broadway Biz, visit bpn.fm slash broadwaybiz.